Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Trainer, the Dean of Georgetown Law, and I'd like to welcome you to a very timely conversation today. Our guest speakers will be Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver of New Mexico and Secretary of State R. Kyle R. Dine of Louisiana. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Looking forward to, to hearing from you shortly. They are respectively the current and incoming presidents of NASS, the National Association of Secretaries of State. Uh, I'd also like to recognize the Georgetown Project on State and Local Government Policy and Law, SALPAL for short, uh, for organizing it. And I'd particularly like to thank its leaders, uh, Professor Sheila Foster, our Ginsburg Professor of Urban Law and Policy, the faculty advisor, and our executive director, Meryl Chertoff. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Paul Smith, an election law expert and distinguished visitor from practice for moderating. Uh, in our federalist system, the framers left to the state's responsibility for the mechanics of selecting electors to the Electoral College. This is usually a formality managed efficiently but quietly through the professional of the offices of the secretaries of state. But in some elections, like the 2000 Bush-Gore election and this year, because the election is taking place in the middle of a global pandemic and other issues, the selection has become the focus of intense scrutiny. We hope that you'll learn more about what secretaries of state do each year and what they're doing this very important presidential election year. And if you find this conversation interesting, I hope you'll learn more about the work of Sal Pal on state and local government and how those governments interact with the federal government. So, let me now turn matters over to Professor Foster and thank you all for joining us for this very important discussion. Professor Foster. Thank you, Dean Trainer, and thank you for your support of the project. Without you, we wouldn't be here <laughs> as a project um, looking at these important issues through the lens of state and local government, law and policy. Um, we are going to be joined today, as you know, by two secretaries of state, uh, the secretary of state from um, New Mexico, who was elected in 2016, the secretary of state from um, Louisiana, elected in 2018. And Dean Trainer has already indicated that they're president and incoming president for NAS. Um, our own Paul Smith um, will be moderating, uh, will be the main moderator asking questions. For those of you who don't know Professor Smith, he is a professor from practice at the law school and served as the vice president for litigation and strategy at the Campaign Legal Center. So um, I think it would not be an overstatement to say that he really is at the center of everything that's happening right now um, on um, with respect to our elections and all of the litigation and challenges. Um, and uh, myself and Professor Chertoff will um, um, engage as well with questions if um, we can find an opening, uh, but certainly at the end, we're going to um, curate student questions and also bring some of our own from students as well. So without further ado, over to you, Professor Smith. Thank you, Sheila. And let me add my welcome to our distinguished guests, Secretary Arduin and Secretary Toulouse Oliver. Uh, we're really honored to have you with us. Uh, and it's really a great time to be talking about the work of Secretaries of State. I think a lot of people really don't know about this job. But uh, in, in some times you labor in uh, obscurity, but you're always important because you're responsible for running the uh, electoral system of a whole state in your, New Mexico and Louisiana. In this case, uh, and you guys, I have to say, did not have exquisite timing in coming into these jobs right now as you're coming into a year when we're uh, facing a country that is both incredibly angry and polarized and facing a once in a century pandemic. So let me uh, start with kind of an open ended question to each of you. How's it been going and what did you have to do to uh, change the system to make it work? Why don't you start, uh, Secretary Luz Oliver? Sure. Well, thank you, Professor Smith and uh, Professors Foster, Chertoff, Dean Trainer, the whole Georgetown, Sal Powell crew, Georgetown Law School, all of the above uh, for having my dear friend, uh, Secretary Arduin and I here today. Um, I know that I spend most of my days literally doing this, talking to folks uh, about the election process, how it works, how it's working this year. Um, but it is a particular honor and pleasure for me to be here speaking uh, with this particular group. So thank you for having me. I think in short, uh, this has been a really rough year. And I think 
those of us who have been in election administration for a long time, as I have and as Secretary Erdwin have, we both served in other roles uh, prior to our current roles that had to do with running elections in our respective states. Um, every election, and particularly every presidential election, is a challenge. And it's a challenge because there are things that you can foresee and plan for and get ready for and have a great response, uh, you know, sort of in place to be able to address those issues. And then there are always the unknown factors that pop up every election. You know that there's going to be some issue, some really important detail that's going to come to light in an election year, especially a presidential election. You don't necessarily know what that is. And obviously, um, those of us that were just kind of uh, thinking it was going to be an average, quote unquote, presidential election year, although I don't think any of us thought that uh, at the beginning of this year, were of course then, uh, you know, blindsided by COVID-19. And the, this has just brought such an intense level of challenge to our ability to plan and execute safe, efficient, and accurate elections. But that doesn't mean um, that we've been unable to do that. In fact, I personally believe that every chief election official and local election official across the country have really risen to this challenge. But in short, it's been very hard, very complicated, very challenging. Um, and uh, I know we're all going to be really happy uh, and proud when, when we finally get through uh, the final days of this election process. I think we all share that. Uh, Secretary Ardoin. Well, certainly this is obviously, uh, the, as Maggie said, this, is, this has been far from the, uh, the norm. Um, when, you, when we stepped into this year, uh, it looked very promising. Um, we had a great meeting uh, for secretaries of state uh, at our winter meeting in D.C. Uh, we were looking forward to learning new and great ideas. And then when we come home, COVID hit. Uh, hit Louisiana particularly hard, um, and I thought that was pretty challenging. Uh, we delayed our elections, our presidential preference primary, uh, from uh, April all the way to uh, originally June, and then we pushed it back even further to July. Um, and then shortly after the August 15th uh, election, we get hit by a major hurricane. Uh, so nothing has been uh, normal. Uh, when you move elections back, it crams up the time frame that we have because you can't move a presidential. And so we've, we, we compacted that time frame. And so it made things a lot more um, challenging uh, for elections. And then add on to that uh, all the political polarization, not just in Washington, but also uh, what has drifted down into each of our states uh, and local uh, uh, governmental units. So it's it's been far more challenging than we have even anticipated. Uh, when you uh, have to create opportunities uh, in a devastated area for folks to vote, um, that makes it much more difficult um, in, in terms of physical uh, delivery of an election, as well as dealing with the fears and the concerns of, of COVID-19. So, um, but we as secretaries of state are, raise, are rising to the challenge and um, uh, we couldn't do it without our local election officials and we are pleased that they are assisting as well. And uh, so we hope to explore some of these issues today. I want to thank Sal Powell and Georgetown for all uh, that you're doing to put forth this uh, this venue for us to talk about these important issues and to discuss the, the jobs that we do as uh, secretaries and uh, you know one of the uh, important things that Maggie and I have to do, not only as our chief elections officers for our state, um, but we're also trying to balance our um, national association, which is the longest surviving bipartisan organization. Um, and believe you me, that's pretty challenging for us in, in, in this year. Thanks. So one of the uh, things that's happened, of course, has been a massive shift in terms of preferences toward voting by uh, mail. Uh, all across the country, uh, maybe with some variance from state to state, but surely a, a massive shift for e everywhere. And that has uh, come not without quite a bit of controversy. Indeed, I think it's fair to say there's been several hundred lawsuits uh, against your colleagues around the country about how to do that, what safeguards to have in place, who gets to vote by mail, a whole, whole series of issues. I have to confess, I. Uh, I contributed a few to that number myself in, in other states, of course, not in your states. Uh, but uh, Secretary Erdogan, I know there, there has been a lot of controversy in your state about the question of who gets to vote absentee or, or by mail. 
uh, including some litigation in federal court. Could you just tell us a little bit about where that stands in terms of the, the, what kinds of excuse you now have to have to vote in the general election this year? Sure. So um, we just um, ended a, um, I say ended, is there still the possibility of an appeal? Um, but uh, so the judge ruled that what we offered in terms of absentee excuses um, last July and August uh, should also be offered uh, for the November um, and December elections. Uh, Louisiana is a little bit different, um, as you, as you know. Um, so we had to have we end up having a December runoff if it, if it's necessary for our federal offices. Um, but we uh, so we're offering additional five COVID nineteen. Uh, related excuses uh, along with the 11 um, that are in current law. Um, we originally did not offer those just because there were so few individuals that took advantage of it. Uh, and when we developed that, we were in stay at home mode. Now we're into phase three reopening. Um, and so we didn't feel like those were absolutely necessary, but uh, um, the court ruled that way. So we're moving forward with it. And um, Louisiana is going to have a challenge on its hands. Uh, we're actually, we just, we're now in the second day of our, uh, of a special session called by the legislature. The only, I think the only set, only the second time in history that the legislature has called itself into session. Um, and some election issues are on, on that agenda. Uh, we're facing, we now are looking at a, uh, over nine, 190,000 um, absentee ballot requests. Um, and which is a record in our state, um, more than we've ever seen before. And we will have to deal with those uh, by figuring out how we can count those and have election results um, by election night. Um, I'm challenged by the expectation. Um, so I'm trying to dampen down those expectations, but we are pushing legislation to allow us to verify and prep absentee ballots four days in advance of the election um, so that we can be prepared to tabulate beginning on election day. Um, our goal is to try to have results as we always have unofficial, um, but complete results on election day, but that's becoming uh, more and more challenging for our state. Um, and uh, my concern is as an election official and an election administrator, if folks um, don't have complete and unofficial results on election night, then they may um, jump to conspiracy theories and cause more issues uh, than we already have to deal with. So a lot of managing of expectations, but also managing the actual mechanics of, of an election. And um, I think uh, folks don't really understand all the mechanics. I think Maggie would agree from whether it's the county or parish level or on the state level um, from her previous service uh, and current service that um, those expectations are pretty high uh, and the level of cooperation it takes from the state and local uh, requires a lot of effort and just the average American um, doesn't understand everything that goes into administering elections. So that's a challenge in and of itself, along with the things that we can't control, like the Postal Service, um, you know, whether or not that ballot was returned on time, um, whether or not the absentee request was delivered on time, all those sorts of things that we have to manage that the fingers get pointed to us and we don't really have any control over. So Secretary Tooms Oliver, I assume New Mexico is also facing a very large increase in absentee requests and uh, facing the challenges that go with that. Um, what, one of the things I wonder about that is, uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of polling place closures? Is there like consolidation going on of the places where people can vote in person if they choose to do that? And how, how does that work in terms of making those, those calls? Yeah, um, so we definitely had some polling place closures for the primary election. Our primary election here in New Mexico was in June. And of course, we were in the throes of planning and preparation and the early voting period, right as we were hitting the, the peak uh, of the first wave of the pandemic, as we were under stay at home orders and businesses were closed throughout the state. Um, and particularly challenging at that time, and I think generally challenging for all election officials this election year has been the ability to have adequate staffing at the polling locations, uh, because for a variety of reasons, you know, the, the standard folks who serve as poll officials and actually run the elections on the ground 
uh, every single election are uh, not available this time around or choosing not to be uh, participating this time around because uh, often, uh, and in fact in New Mexico, 80% of our poll officials uh, have been traditionally over the age of 65, so are in this very, you know, high risk uh, for uh, the, you know, potential deleterious effects of COVID community. So when you don't have enough people to staff polling places and further, uh, when you, as we did in New Mexico, have a drastic increase in uh, vote by mail ballots, absentee ballots coming in. In fact, uh, over 65% of our voters in the primary election, which by the way, was a record turnout for a primary election in New Mexico, chose to vote absentee. So by necessity, we consolidated and closed down a number of polling locations in the state. However, we have tried really hard now that we've had a little bit more time between the primary and the general election to plan, to recruit and hire poll officials. Uh, we, we are going out of our way to try to prevent that from happening. And at this point, 34 days before election day, we are not planning to consolidate or close any additional polling locations. We are uh, adequately staffed, it appears at this point, to be able to staff those locations. And that will serve to, uh, of course, for those voters who do choose to vote in person, whether they early vote or vote on election day, to help maintain that social distancing uh, and to keep uh, you know, the volume of individuals because we're still operating under you know, uh, a, a limitation to how many individuals can physically be in a polling place, but without having long lines and prolonging the election process for voters. So it's a delicate balance that's really hard to strike, especially when you don't know exactly how many voters you're gonna have participate by one means or the other, but it is a, a balance that we are trying to strike very effectively for the voters of our state. So there's been a lot of controversy about uh, voting by mail and how um, fraud is prevented. And in, in particular, how do you verify that this is a real ballot that came from a real person who, who's, who's actually the person whose name is on the ballot? Um, and I was wondering if you could just share with us how each of your states do do that. Do you use the traditional signature matching process or is there, are there other methods you have to make sure that there, there's no, the, the system doesn't get uh, riddled with fraud? Uh, Secretary Erdogan first. Well, we certainly use the uh, signature verification form format, uh, but also we require a witness um, for each absentee ballot. Um, additionally, uh, on the front end of that process, we require an, an individual to request an absentee ballot of which they have to fill out a form identifying themselves, providing the necessary information that that is uh, supposed to match what's in our system. And so those are called through at first um, to make sure that the person who's requesting it is the person really in fact we're mailing. To. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and so then the ballot is sent and then when it's returned, uh, obviously it has to have the witness and we do the verification, which is why uh, with such a large number our increase uh, potentially in um, absentee ballots, uh, we need that time frame in order to prep and verify uh, those absentee ballots. And uh, of course, asking the patience of candidates running for office, the press reporting on the election, and the people who are actually doing the voting. So um, sure. all important parts of this in order for us to have confidence of the public in this process. How about New Mexico? How do you do it there, Secretary? Sure. Well, we have a similar process to Louisiana. We do require a voter to apply for an absentee ballot on the front end, and they need to provide uh, some specific information about who they are and how they're registered to vote to request that ballot. Uh, ballot is mailed to them, and then when they return the ballot, uh, we require a signature and the last four digits of their social security number. We actually are one of only seven states that still require a social security number to register to vote. Uh, we got a waiver uh, from the Help America Vote Act in 2003 to maintain that practice. So we have sort of an extra tool in the toolbox to be able to verify identities here um, that actually makes it a, a much easier process for the voter uh, to have their ballot counted. But I think it's 
it's important to emphasize that no matter which state you're in and what specific process is followed, um, you know, these are these are processes that have been heavily thought through, debated, discussed. Um, the law, you know, occasionally changes to accommodate, you know, the the uh, the more current technology, all right, or the more current voting behavior. But um, there is no state in our country um, that is not doing something to verify uh, that the ballot has been cast by the voter uh, that uh, is saying who they are, right? So I think that's something really important that even though it looks different, um, that there is always a process no matter where you live. Well, thank you for saying that. I guess from your national perspective as President Nass, you sort of know that the states are doing it all a little bit differently, but they're all doing it. Uh, with good track records, and it seems like not a problem that people ought to concern, be concerned about. Um, but one of the things that people are concerned about is the post office, as you mentioned already. How serious a problem do you think that is in terms of the, uh, the at least the perceived slowing down of the mails? Is that going to make a lot more ballots come in late and cause votes not to be counted? Or what, what are you doing about that in terms of drop boxes or any other response? Uh, we'll stay with you, uh, Secretary Toulouse Oliver. Well, first of all, um, I have been in constant conversation with our local and regional postal service representatives here in New Mexico since well before our primary election. And we've built not only uh, an incredible communication mechanism, but accountability mechanisms in place to ensure that every ballot is tracked, uh, that we know where they are at any given time, and that the Postal Service has gone out of their way to make sure that ballots get to their intended delivery point on time. Um, and I will also say that in the last uh, couple of months, we have started building what I think is a very effective uh, communication uh, between uh, Secretary Arduin and I and uh, our colleagues uh, across the country and the U.S. Postmaster General and his senior staff. Like Wise, not only with those channels of communication that we've developed, there are accountability mechanisms that are being put into place uh, where we are being alerted um, to, you know, potential changes, information, and, and, and to make a long story short, um, based on all of this communication and these accountability mechanisms, I personally am feeling very confident in the ability of our United States Postal Service to get this job done, and they have given us their solemn commitment that this is going to be their number one priority uh, through this year uh, and that they are more than capable of handling this task. But with that being said, um, here in New Mexico, we are providing a Dropbox option at every polling location. And in some very rural areas that do not have very good mail uh, service uh, in those communities, a Dropbox option, uh, it looks different from state to state, but that's what we're doing here. You have particular problems with Indian reservations in terms of the mail and not having the typical addresses and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's that's a particularly difficult. Those are particularly difficult communities to ensure. Um, you know, we have a lot of communities uh, like that where voters maybe receive their mail all in one location, um, or uh, you know, as you mentioned, they do not have standard addresses. Um, in New Mexico, you can register to vote where you live, uh, and you can even either draw a map or use some GPS. Or, or describe where you live, you can say, you know, the third tree from the left um, off of, you know, this turnoff on Highway 182, right? So we do have those challenges and uh, building out this Dropbox program to help facilitate delivery of that clerk, of that ballot back to the county clerk, I think is going to be an important uh, key in ensuring the voter participation for those communities. Great. Thanks. Secretary Arduin, how, how, how are you doing on the, the mails in, in Louisiana and drop boxes or whatever? Well, um, certainly I want to uh, appreciate what NAS has done. Uh, we've worked really hard to um, get the attention of the U.S. Postmaster General, of which we were successfully able to do and had a broad call with secretaries and the, the, the general himself and his high um, ranking staff. Um, we got answers to a lot of our questions and more importantly, we were able to make contact uh, with some folks that can move some things because uh, particularly for Louisiana in the hurricane hit areas uh, where there was a massive destruction, uh, we have um, suspended services. And so um, we are concerned with how folks are able to um, receive their mail. Um, be able to get absentee ballots as they uh, request them and be able to get them returned on time. Um, we, we're not um, 
very fond of drop boxes uh, in Louisiana due to the concerns of ballot harvesting, uh, which we have made illegal in the state um, in the last regular session uh, of this year. Um, so we are uh, focused in on what we call curbside drop off. Uh, so actual live folks are uh, receiving, will be receiving those ballots for those parishes that opt into the program. We are providing state support for that service. Um, that way uh, we are able to have another um, check and balance on the process where if an individual is dropping off a ballot, uh, they have to show ID. If it's not the uh, individual's ballot, uh, then they, um, under current law for quite some time, they have to fill out a, um, a form that uh, denotes who they are, what their relationship is to the individual for whom they drop, they're dropping off the ballot, um, and also provide their ID um, for that as well. Um, so additional checks and balances to facilitate additional uh, ways for people to be able to participate in the election. We feel comfortable with that uh, moving forward and um, are hoping that uh, a lot more parishes will participate in that. Of course, you have some rural areas that don't really call it curbside drop-off. Um, they've already been um, putting out signage over years outside the courthouse uh, with a phone number and they they text or they call and someone runs down and they, they you know, pick, pick up John or Betty's um, ballot and uh, they know them because uh, they're such a rural community and so uh, we're excited that uh, folks are you know, can participate in this way um, and people feel confident in this process. We just, great. Yeah. yeah, we got a lot of uh, uh, f um, negative feedback on just having uh, drop boxes without any security. Um, and, right. and we're so close to the election, it was hard to implement that anyway. Let me ask you about a different topic. One of the things you, do, you guys do as secretaries of state is by federal law, maintain statewide the databases of all the registered voters in your states. Uh, and one of the things people were concerned about coming out of the last presidential election was the degree of security that those registration records had. There, was report, there were reports that uh, foreign actors were kind of wandering around inside your computers and uh, not necessarily changing anything, at least then, but that there was a, there was a real vulnerability. What, what have you guys done or what has NAS done to try to harden the computer security uh, of those incredibly important things, which are the registration records, because if they disappear, then people show up, they can't vote. So, uh, Secretary Cluzano, you've probably been doing this for the past four years, right? At, uh, sure. <laughs> well, Secretary Ardwin uh, and I both, uh, you know, I've been, again, fortunate to be working with him for a while now, because he had the you know, uh, the good fortune or, or bad fortune, as you might say, to be the assistant. Uh, yeah. so your state in the past. So when I walked into my first uh, NAS meeting in January of 2017, of course, we had just come through the, uh, the unreal scenario, right, of having these threats uh, posed to our uh, election systems and also still knowing very, very little at that point about what had actually happened because there was no communication uh, protocol that had been developed between you know, the federal government whose intelligence uh, bureaus were able to detect this nefarious activity and the chief election officials of the states, right? There, it was very disjointed. And so one of the first things that we started working on when I came in uh, shortly after the 2016 election was building out this relationship and this communication protocol. So now I can tell you with 100% confidence that uh, Department of Homeland Security in particular, which really runs point on these efforts, knows exactly who to tell and what to tell and when to tell it. Uh, we all have uh, top secret security clearances at this point. We're getting regularly briefed along with key staff. Um, but here's the important thing to know. Um, what really happened in 2016 was very minor in terms of the actual impact. We know no votes were changed. We know that no voter registration records were actually affected, but there was a lot of uh, scanning and attempts to, you know, poke around in the systems, as you say, and try to find out. So we have really shored up uh, our individual state election systems to protect against that work. And we're working collectively as an association and with our partners at the federal level and the state and local level to continue to build out those protections for our systems, I can tell you that we are in an order of magnitude better place in terms of election security at the national and at the state level than we were in 2016. Is there anything you can share with us about any attempts that have been made to try to pierce that new, much more hardened shield in, in the past few weeks or months? Or 
but we well, what folks should know is that those attempts never stop. You know, those efforts never stop. You know, whether they're trying to come in the form of a, a distributed denial of service DDoS at, uh, attack, or whether they're coming in the form of malware, uh, ransomware, phishing attempts, right? Um, they are coming at us constantly. Um, and so there's not a lot that I can say on specific threats or specific attacks, but what I can say is when something does happen in any community that potentially affects election infrastructure, we are being notified immediately. And even though that individual uh, entity or community may be kept anonymous for at least the time being, we are forewarned of these potential threats to our individual state and local systems so that we can act accordingly to prevent them from happening to us. Great. Secretary Ardoin, uh, you mentioned that you guys are trying to um, accelerate the, the pre-processing of the mail ballots so that you can get the results out uh, on election night or, or pretty soon uh, thereafter. One of the things that a lot of people are concerned about based on some press reports lately is that there'll be some states that may go weeks without fully being able to count as New York did after its primary. And we saw some other really slow counts and this will end up being part of a big post-election battle about whether there's fraud going on and whether the legislature should shut it all down and stuff. You, you, you saw all the reports about the Atlantic article and everything. What do you, what do you, what's your perspective on all that? You think this, these things are, um, concerns are overblown and that the, your fellow secretaries of state are uh, going to be able to handle the bullseye of pressure that is going to descend on all of you on, on election day? <laughs> There's no doubt about the, um, the bullseye descending upon us and the pressure uh, des uh, descending upon us. Um, I think you don't have to go very far back in history to see uh, how a Secretary of State was made very infamous or famous, however you look at it, <laughs> um, and which, whichever perspective you have. Uh, on it. Um, I don't think any of us want to be in that position. And I think since that time frame, uh, we've all been working in our states to avoid that type of situation. Certainly, um, what doesn't help is when um, um, courts um, go beyond what the legislature has done and require states to count ballots um, a week or weeks after an election. That's when folks um, in uh, average citizens start believing that there, there's something foul uh, going on or amiss. Um, I would, you know, I, I try to temper those types of things. And, and of course, I want to temper it in Louisiana. And so that's why we're looking at doing things in advance um, because we've not been forced to do so. And so any process that prevents us from being able to have unofficial and complete election results on election night then would actually create those concerns amongst the public. Um, you know, those states that have such a, a much larger population in Louisiana and um, those swing states, um, there's going to be uh, cries of foul on both sides, regardless of what we as election officials do and how we preside over um, these situations and the administration of the elections. A lot of times uh, folks don't understand. They think the Secretary of State is actually responsible for every aspect of it, in which in some cases in many states, uh, the Secretary of State has no authority over the local election officials and that they are independent upon themselves, uh, in and of themselves, uh, and their own processes. Uh, not all states have what Louisiana has, which is a top-down state, so every parish follows the same rules and regulations and requirements and processes, um, and everything looks alike. Uh, but some states, you know, every it's different from county to county, and that's what we witnessed in Florida uh, when it was Bush v. Gore. And so uh, I, I just urge folks to, to take a deep breath. Uh, we are a uh, democracy. Uh, which means that we are a progress and work all the time, every day of every year of of every millennial. And, and we're going to continue to we make mistakes, but we're also looking uh, to improve uh, from election to election. Um, and that if we aren't tempered in our reactions, then we're bringing upon ourselves what our adversaries, foreign adversaries, are trying to do to us from within. Um, and that is uh, to take down our democracy. And so if uh, we're all believers in the American experiment, uh, then we need to believe and work with our election officials and understand, look to understand uh, 
important trusted information from your elected officials, whether they're the local level or the state level, um, and, and not believe everything you read on the internet. I'm still answering questions about embedded um, letters in barcodes on envelopes of absentee ballots. Well, guess what? Louisiana doesn't have barcodes on absentee ballot envelopes. Never have. But there's still this belief out there, and it, it originated from another state from one very particular election that I got information on. But that, that, that's what's going on, and that's what we're dealing with, and that's the frustration from our part. We can't get enough positive information out there to, to thwart all this negative um, um, conspiracy theories, whether it's the left or the right. Uh, I mean, it's like, you know, there are those of us in NAS that talk about, I wish we could quit talking about voter suppression as much as we talk about voter fraud. I mean, you know, are we really still in that? Yes, there are cases of suppression. Yes, there are cases of fraud. But the reality is that we're all working in our respective states to do the job the voters set us out to do. And it turns out that when we are so polarized and we're so fractioned and we were, we're so wanting to believe something bad is going to happen that we forget the very fundamentals of our elections and our democracy and that we have to believe in the process. And if we don't believe in the process, then we're no better off than any other form of government out there because we're going to crumble under our own weight. And so uh, I know Maggie and I have talked about this on numerous, numerous occasions. I'm sorry, I keep calling her Maggie, Secretary Toulouse Oliver. Oh, um, so, um, but that, that's where we are as election officials all across this state, trying desperately to get the proper information out. We want people to participate. There's nothing wrong for every individual who is appropriately registered in their state, no matter what those laws are, to, from participating. And we want the maximum participation because we're only as good as we all are in terms of our participation in this democracy. And so, you know, I just urge folks to be tempered in their, in their um, comments tempered in their reactions, don't believe everything on social media, because if I believed everything on social media, I would think I should be imprisoned and hung. Um, and that's just not, that's not a fact. You know, that's just not. I just want to echo all, literally everything that Secretary Erdogan just said, and just say, I think we're done here, because you <laughs> said it all. <laughs> Let me ask a, a follow-up on that, but maybe slightly unfair, Secretary Toulouse, all over. No, please. One of, the, one of the things that some people, I think, think about when they're when they're being suspicious of you guys is uh, that uh, you're political actors yourselves, and that you run on the party line for these positions. And then, yeah, some of your colleagues have moved up to be governors in recent times, and yeah. even were doing the job while they were running for governor and stuff. Um, and we're not asking you to comment on any particular other state or anything, but do you think that that is a, a contributing factor to the level of suspicion or is it maybe this year there's, we don't need contributing factors. Everybody's already crazy, but. Uh. You know, first of all, to that point, um, it, it's such a hard balance to strike. And it's, it's something that I've ch been challenged with balancing, you know, in my 10 years as a local election official and now as secretary of state, um, because to your point, we run on a party banner and we're, you know, elected under a party banner. And, but here's the thing. I mean, I think the flip side is that you, you have appointed officials, right? And, uh, you know, it looks a little bit different in every state, but, you know, either a board of elections or some other entity that oversees elections and you have, you know, political actors that are appointing those individuals. And, you know, you cannot, you literally cannot separate politics from the election process. Um, there is no perfect way to go about this. There are pros and cons to doing it either way. So what can we do as election officials is we can be as forthcoming and transparent as possible, right? Which I know that I do. And we, we can build processes into our election systems that are transparent um, so that there's literally no piece of the election process that goes unobserved uh, in a public way, right? Um, those things are really important. But I think to your, to your ultimate point, Professor Smith, I don't know that it's possible uh, unfortunately, in this environment that we're in for, uh, you know, folks to be able to put trust in the words of somebody from the other side uh, of the political aisle, which is truly unfortunate because I can say that to a person and I, I will 
put my colleague, uh, Secretary Erdogan here as a prime example, there, that each and every one of us is supremely dedicated to conducting fair and accurate elections um, and that we hold that duty and responsibility extremely sacred and that we do leave our politics at the door when we walk into our offices. Um, but just saying that, unfortunately, I don't think in this toxic partisan environment does enough. So we just have to keep emphasizing information, transparency, um, and really, I think, you know, to Secretary Erdogan's point, when folks don't have enough information, they will fill that vacuum with suspicion and conspiracy uh, and, and you know, it, it's incompetency, it's malfeasance, it's misfeasance, right? And so our job is to make sure we are getting ahead of that curve and just giving folks as much information as we can possibly give them. Thanks for that. I, what, what, I want to take the opportunity if we have a couple more minutes before we move on to other questions to ask you about the National Association of Secretaries of State, which you, you were heading and which uh, Secretary Erdogan's about to, uh, you, you must be having a very busy year at the association level. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you could, the, the association is trying to help all 50 secretaries of state uh, do the job better and get through the, uh, the, the trying period we're facing. I, I can't say enough about our organization. Uh, it, it is, you know, as, as Secretary Erdwin mentioned, it is the nation's oldest nonpartisan uh, professional organization for elected officials. It is truly nonpartisan in every sense of the word. Um, so I'm a Democrat. I'm currently the president this year. Secretary Erdwin's a Republican. He will come up next year. The president to follow him will be a Democrat, et cetera, et cetera. All of our committees are co-chaired by both parties. Um, we do not make a decision as an organization or take on an issue as an organization without the buy-in of uh, you know, a bipartisan or nonpartisan community within our organization. And I think that in this day and age is particularly challenging for us to find that common ground. But I'll tell you what, we can find a heck of a lot of common ground. We've done that with cybersecurity, you know, and we've come together as an organization. Those 40 of us who are the chief election officials of our state are meeting on a weekly basis, preparing for the elections, sharing best practices, sharing information with each other um, that is going to be helpful and have helpful applications in other states. So it, it is just a tremendous resource, I personally believe, for us in our states. Great. What, one other concern that's out there, and the, maybe it's conspiracy theory, maybe it isn't, the concern that there's going to be people showing up at the polling places this, this year on November 3rd who were there to try to scare other people away from voting. Uh, and you know, I know there's laws against this and stuff, but I wonder if, Secretary Ardoin, if you could tell us about what it is election officials can do to prepare for that. It's not the easiest thing to, to prevent, I suppose. You have, to, you have to be able to be nimble, and it's happening at a very localized level when it happens, right? That's very true. And so we have laws on the book that prevent folks um, from um, that type of suppression. Um, we, uh, the commissioner in charge is authorized to call law enforcement out um, to a polling location if someone is disrupting the process of voting. Um, it is a, uh, a prosecutable uh, offense. Um, and uh, we take it very seriously. Uh, we get reports on our hotline and then we report it to the local clerks um, of those issues. We also have investigators on the ground uh, all throughout the state um, to be able to thwart those types of efforts and um, if we have to work with the local officials to call in law enforcement. We just passed a new law that will allow um, any report of any disturbance um, be issued to the clerk and the clerk can call law enforcement instead of just the commissioner in charge um, so that in case the commissioner in charge is being threatened or um, their uh, communication is disabled, uh, then we have another authority that can, can uh, deal with that situation. Additionally, in Louisiana, we have something very different than others. Um, and I think other states need to look at it. Um, um, because I would hate for us to go backwards, and that is we have a 600, minimum 600 foot um, distance for any political activity outside of a polling location. Um, 600 feet is, is, some people think is too much, uh, unless they're on private property. They can be on private property, but the, uh, we utilize public places um, 
for a vast majority, if not 90% plus of our polling locations so that we can control the, the environment and protect folks' right to, uh, to vote in person should they choose to do so. Uh, and so I think that's a very important part of that process um, to keep a distance. Uh, we understand free speech, but your free speech isn't right, uh, isn't a right when it inf uh, interferes with someone else's freedom uh, to exercise their, their right to vote. Um, which is another form of freedom of speech. It's just in secrecy. Um, but uh, so it, that's a very serious issue. Uh, a lot of commissioners are concerned about their safety uh, um, prior to all of this polarization that we receive. A lot of commissioners asked if they could have law enforcement at, at the uh, polling locations. And of course, you know, uh, Professor, that's a big no-no. Um, <laughs> it, 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 and in fact, is an intimidator uh, for other folks um, who um, feel oppressed by right. um, law enforcement. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough balancing act, but I think we're doing it well. Um, and um, by expanding early voting opportunities, um, that makes it even that much more difficult, in my opinion, um, for folks not to have the ability to participate, but also for you know, individuals who are trying to disrupt that opportunity. Uh, because we can control those environments even better because many of them are already in courthouses uh, where there's uh, the ability uh, for quick reactions. Um, if not, they're in very public facilities um, and we are allowed to have security um, for crowd control. Uh, and that has not deterred anyone from participating because our numbers in early voting continue to increase and our African-American participation in early voting continues to increase. So I feel really good about where we are in Louisiana in terms of securing our polling locations, giving people the right to participate and the safety of our commissioners, as well as the safety of our voters who, for those who, who try to disrupt the process. Um, so um, I, I appreciate the opportunity for answering that question because that was very important. That's very reassuring. Let me turn it over now to my colleagues, uh, Meryl Chertoff, uh, and maybe Sheila, I don't know if she's doing it too. Let's see if they have any questions from the audience or from them. And uh, I'm going to be disappearing in a minute or two. I have another panel at six, but I'll stay for a sure. little while. Yeah, That's no, I just have a pleasure. Thank you, Professor Smith. That was a brilliant <laughs> moderation. Uh, really appreciate those questions. I just have one quick follow up um, for both of you, and particularly Secretary Ardwin, you talked a lot about the state legislature just passed a law, the state legislature just passed a law. And also for you, um, uh, Secretary Toulouse Oliver, how active are your state legislatures right now in responding to some of the voting challenges? So we've heard a little bit um, because I, I, I'm surprised to uh, to hear that much activity actually on the on the state legislative level. And I just wonder how common that is in the states. Well, I don't know how common it is for other states, but it is very common in our state. Uh, all election um, code changes have to go through. Uh, the legislature, um, if it is a um, adaptation of the law or an interpretation of the law through the administrative code, um, then we still have to go through oversight um, hearings for those um, should there, they be requested. So we're accountable at all times uh, to the legislature. But um, since this pandemic began, uh, we've been extremely active with the legislature. Um, we've now been through three emergency election plans. Um, mm -hmm and um, all requiring the legislature to vote up or down. Um, it has to go through the committee process um, and, and both committees have to approve it. And taking a step back, if I declare an emergency for the election, the governor has to agree to that emergency. And then we have to turn around and both um, committees with jurisdiction have to approve the emergency before they can even consider the plan. Uh, so it's a very cumbersome process one by which uh, there is legislation in the special session right now to try to reform or streamline that process um, and to create actual commission to deal with the initial stages of it and then forward that to the legislature. So we'll see how that goes. But the legislature is extremely active in uh, election policy. And it sounds like particularly right now, given COVID and everything else is going on, oh, that was absolutely. really my question. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, Secretary Toulouse, Oliver. 
Sure. Um, New Mexico is uh, somewhat unusual. We have a legislature that meets very infrequently to begin with, and so calling in them into special session is also pretty rare. Uh, they did come into special session this summer between the primary and the general election and did make some uh, general election 2020 specific changes to address specifically the conditions of the pandemic. And I will say that, that I think that the legislative activity that we're seeing right now, I mean, as a rule, um, across the country, legislatures do not want to be changing the rules of the game while the game is underway. Um, of course, you're seeing a very active legislature in Louisiana because the conditions on the ground continue to change and that is necessitated there. Um, but we did, we did have a special session, which, you know, is, is unusual uh, in New Mexico. Uh, to address the pandemic generally and election specifically. Um, but wow, I, I have nothing but sympathy for Kyle because you know you're, we're 34 days out from election day. I mean, I don't think folks understand how, you know, you're really trying to, to turn the Titanic around at this point when you're making changes this close to an election. It's really hard to do and really ill-advised unless it's for a really important reason. So, uh, you know, my, I'll be lighting a candle for you, Kyle. It, it just that it's something that you can, you and your your folks, your parish folks, can manage uh, in the coming weeks because that is a huge challenge. Well, if I can expand upon that, um, the, the things that we're facing, um, we're able to. Um, we initially had put in the emergency plan. Um, the governor rejected it. The legislature approved it, and then the courts took over from there. What the things that the court didn't address were the actual logistical needs uh, of uh, putting on the election. For example, the four days prior to, um, in order to facilitate the processing and verification of absentee ballots, um, the um, the ability to um, allow for the curbside drop-offs and the funding for that mechanism. Additionally, uh, increasing the pay of our polling commissioners uh, for hazard pay, if you will, to try to entice more folks to be part of the process. All those things that were logistically necessary that we asked for that there was no real objection to or things we're now being able to deal with. It just happens that we were in, that they, the legislature was calling itself in. Had they not done that, I was gonna have to come back with another emergency plan to get those logistics. And the, quite frankly, that was the impediment that we faced because it takes the amount of time that the legislature is given to vote on it and the amount of time it takes to actually get it before them, um, we would have been bumping up against the election. And so it, it probably would have been uh, ill-advised to even attempt that. Uh, but these are all positive things. But Maggie's point is well taken because the, you're absolutely correct. We don't want major rules changing in the middle of the election. And, and while folks don't at home don't realize it, we are in the election. Ballots have been mailed out to military overseas, um, 65 and older and other absentee uh, qualifiers. Um, we have about 190,000 plus requests and a vast majority of those have already been mailed out. And so people are already voting and to start changing the process. Um, it, well, you saw it in Wisconsin. It was right up until the night before the, their Supreme Court was actually still making policy for that state. And, and that's just not the way to put on elections. Uh, I want to jump in here. Uh, first of all, um, I, I want to uh, give a shout out to the three research assistants who helped us put together the program. Uh, our Sal Pal research assistants, Mickey Haywood, Bill Rice, uh, and particularly Michael Huerta, who is a native of New Mexico. Um, who uh, made the initial contacts uh, with the two secretaries of state, um, Michael, Mickey, and Bill, thanks very much. Um, I, I do have a few questions, and of course the audience questions are, are tougher than the ones that, that we're asking you. Um, I, the first question that I have for both of you is, uh, do you feel confident that you will make the safe harbor deadline? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, another question uh, is, uh, this is a, a very unusual year, um, and uh, there's been an enormous amount of movement um, and what we call COVID displacement or uh, COVID refugees where people are not in their ordinary residence. Um, what steps are you all taking to be sure that everybody is eligible uh, who is eligible to vote can vote whether or not they are at their usual residence address? 
Well, that's easy for Louisiana because we experienced it after Katrina. Um, so one of our regular uh, absentee ballot re uh, requests is if you're out of town uh, for the election and that's regard for whatever reason uh, and you won't be able to meet early voting uh, deadline or uh, be in your uh, home for or in your um, registration parish uh, for election day. So uh, we're already receiving those for, from folks that are displaced, uh, not just for COVID reasons, but mainly for the Hurricane Laura uh, issues that we face, um, where over 12,000 plus people are, are, are dis, uh, dispersed throughout our state and even into Texas. So um, we're, we're dealing with that in that manner. And, and in New Mexico, um, it doesn't matter where you are currently residing. Uh, you can, uh, you know, be registered to vote uh, at your either your residence where you live, and again, I, you, it can it can be a, a verbal description or a map even of where you're currently residing. As long as you can get your mail somewhere, um, you can be registered to vote. You can register and vote on the same day in New Mexico through the early voting period. So if you have moved, you can re-register and vote in that particular location. And every polling place on election day and in, in, uh, for early voting and on election day is a voting convenience center. So you can vote at any polling place in the county where you're registered. It does not matter where you are currently residing. So uh, just like Louisiana, we are doing a ton to make it convenient for people to vote no matter where they currently are residing in the moment. Uh, okay, another question is um, with respect to others who have responsibility in the process. So to both of you, what is your relationship with county commissioners? Um, does that relationship ever become contentious? To what degree are you supervising them and to what degree are they independent? Um, I'll speak to that one first because I think Kyle may have it a little bit easier than I do. Um, in New Mexico, I have the responsibility for overseeing the election and for prescribing uh, the vast majority of rules and procedures, forms, et cetera. But at the end of the day, and mind you, I was a county clerk, uh, which is the equivalent of a commissioner or uh, excuse me, a, a parish uh, official in, in Louisiana. Um, so I've been on the other side of the equation as well. And I think that there is a necessary but sometimes unfortunate tension that is built into these roles. I am not the boss of the county clerks. They are also independently elected officials from their counties. However, I have the authority to take the election code and interpret it and provide uh, standardization and rules and guidance so that we can have uniformity in our election process throughout the state. Uh, it is mostly a wonderful working relationship because I believe that every county clerk in New Mexico genuinely wants to run a fair and efficient election. It does occasionally become problematic, particularly when politics get involved. Um, so it is sort of just a, an ongoing ebb and flow of, uh, of relationship. So um, positive and negative, so to speak, uh, because we are top down. Um, all local election officials, whether appointed or elected, are required to follow the same um, guidelines, uh, processes, and procedures, which helps us out a lot. Um, can the relationship be contentious? Um, absolutely. You know, the registrars um, in each parish, uh, 64 of them, um, are appointed by their local governing authority and then but yet I pay them and uh, the vast majority of their salary uh, as well as their personnel uh, although I cannot determine who they hire um, uh, I, they do have to um, uh, be evaluated by my office each year uh, on the other hand the parish clerks are elected on the local level um, and like my office, they have numerous other duties outside of elections. Um, so um, it, it's a balancing act, but uh, trying to deal with uh, independent elected local officials uh, can be challenging, although they, being elected, understand what it's like to have a statewide official having to go through an election. And so they understand it from a different perspective than the appointed officials. Uh, but nonetheless, um, working with both groups requires a strong balancing act. Uh, but in the end, um, they would rather me uh, have the broader shoulders than them have to have the broader shoulders to carry the weight and to carry the issues um, and to deal with uh, the legislature and uh, and others involved, especially the press. 
Uh, so we are we are at the closing hour, but I'm going to just give you one more. George Packer had a very interesting article this week um, in the Atlantic Magazine, um, talking about the effects of despair and the sense that one's vote doesn't count as being the worst form of voter suppression. Um, in your role of Secretary of State, what are you doing um, in order to assure people that their vote, in fact, do, does count? Maggie, you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've always believed that every vote counts. The, the ones that don't count are the ones that uh, aren't um, um, acted upon or, or the participants didn't take the time to, to actually get out and, and vote. Uh, democracy, in my opinion, is an activist process. Um, whether you're liberal, conservative, middle of the road, Republican, Democrat, uh, Mickey Mouse Party, I like to say, because we actually do have some people registered in our state under the Mickey Mouse Party. It's only as good as you're willing to exercise that right. And um, the reason why I express uh, the importance of people taking the time to vote. You may not think that your vote in Louisiana can defeat a particular or elect a particular presidential candidate. But I can assure you on a local level, your vote counts in every jurisdiction because there are races decided by a handful of votes on the local level more and on an increasing level or an increasing um, 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 amount um, of, of, of elections over time. And if, if you really want your voice heard, then you've got to take the opportunity to vote, whether it's by absentee or in-person early voting or in-person on election day. We now give um, Louisianians and I would dare say Americans more opportunity to vote than ever in history. And yet people are, are in despair. I, I urge them not to feel the, 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 those types of feelings because it matters. And if it doesn't matter, if you don't think it's going to count, but doesn't it matter enough to you to step out there and to go and make that participation and make your voice heard? I mean, I, I, I've told folks in, a, in an era of masks where communication is less than it's ever been before, isn't that the most important way you can communicate is to step out there and vote, regardless of whether you think it's going to lift somebody to win or defeat somebody or, or whatever it may be. It, it's so important to all those who in some form or fashion, whether it was a war or a conflict or the civil rights movement, whatever it may be that defines democracy for you, isn't it worth all those people who lost their lives or lost loved ones to make it available for you? Isn't it that important? I mean, that's, that's where the worth is. The worth is continuing the democratic process for the future. And I, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't buy into the disparity. I just think they're, they need to look at it more positively and look at the opportunities uh, ahead because civil rights movement didn't happen overnight it built up over time and it was a peaceful build up and demonstration. And there were people, you know, violently opposed to it, but the people who were in support of it were not violent in that. And so isn't that a, a respect for their memory to be able to go out and cast that one vote for, for a candidate or against someone that you think is just violently opposed to what you you believe in so desperately in your life. And so I, I just feel like folks need to really think, not in terms of what where we are today, but thinks in terms of where we've come from in the past and where we're headed in the future and make that decision to participate. Because in the end, those who don't participate, when I'm when I speak to groups, if you didn't vote in the last election, you don't have a right to fuss about what's going on because you didn't think it was important enough. And so the result is because you didn't participate and many others like you. That, that's how I feel. Sorry, I got on my soapbox. Secretary Toulouse Oliver, you want to take a song? I just, I know enough to know when a, a mic has been dropped. The mic has been dropped. Uh, Secretary said it all and I'll just 
echo uh, every vote matters, every vote counts. We have to come together as a nation, every eligible citizen to make our voices heard in this democracy or it will never live up to its potential. It will only live up it, to its potential when we all come together and make our voices heard. Thank you both so much. Thank you. We are very grateful and, and good luck with your work in the weeks ahead. Thank you so much for having us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It was, uh, as Maggie said, it was definitely a, a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, I look forward to all our listeners getting out there and voting and getting their family members and friends to go vote.